And good afternoon. I'm Mark Allen with Gaper IO, and I'm here today with Bura Giza. I think I got that right. Of the CEO of Futurist AI. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Bro, did I get your name right? Yes, you did. No, oh, that's good. So, can you share a brief background of yourself and your work experience? Uh, originally, I'm a software engineer with um, a Master of Science in Artificial Intelligence and a degree in Applied Mathematics. I came to this country about 20 years ago. Then I did an MBA in finance. I became a partner at a um, private equity firm. Hmm. And then I was running the uh, U.S. operation of a 30 billion pension fund. Hmm. When I decided to, you know, develop a software platform by myself really? uh, about two years ago, and that became the basis for Futurist AI. Wow. So you, you wrote the code yourself? I wrote the code myself. I did the database, the front end, the back end, the HTML5. Wow. The uh, AWS servers, uh, everything. This actually started as a just side project to update some of my technical skills. Wow. So, uh, and then it ended up being something significantly different. Wow. So you're a jack of all trades. That's cool. <laughs> Indeed. There's a lot of technology that goes into all those different parts of an application. I know. <laughs> uh, yes. So Python, jQuery. Mm -hmm. And, and thank God for AWS, because that does make your job easier, doesn't it? Uh, the, 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 that is correct. I mean, it's quite neat to do to deploy some of those. Um, uh, it, it, I, I mean, relatively speaking, it was a breeze to do. You know, it took me about two years, though, but still. Yeah. Well, that, yeah. I mean, relatively speaking, yes. For one person to build an enterprise application in two years, that's good. So, so what has been your uh, experience with, with remote employment, both as a remote employee and a remote employer? Uh, I mean, most of my career, I have actually worked remotely. Uh, when I was basically doing private equity, most of our investments were actually um, in Europe. Mm. So I would spend a considerable portion of my time in hotel rooms where I would actually work uh, uh, remotely. So even when I was uh, working uh, in finance, that was our setup, and that was the, exactly the same way that I worked um, for the, the pension fund. We did have an office, but again, we had um, two billion worth of investment that I was supervising in the U.S. And, um, you know, we tended to spend quite a number of uh, hours at our portfolio companies hmm. uh, where we had to, again, work. So technically, uh, I spent most of my career outside of a formal office hmm. environment. So you probably have a lot of frequent flyer miles, correct? <laughs> uh, I used to be the fifth most flying person on British Airways. Wow. Yes, that's but, a lot. Uh, I flew with the Concorde, lovely plane. I mean, very, uh, in any case, yes. Yeah, that's Good interesting. Question. So in general, what's been your takeaway from working like this over the years? Uh, if you're set up correctly and you're basically working with uh, professionals, it can work really, really great. Mm -hmm. uh, you do lose basically some of um, you know, uh, some efficacy, perhaps, if uh, just because of the fact that certain people are not uh, literally in front of you. Mm -hmm. But as long as you are dealing with, you know, as long as you're set up for it and you're dealing with um, people who are motivated, mm -hmm. uh, I don't really see any, you know, material uh, issues. Yeah. I mean, we, you know, uh, all um, the, 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 the start of basically Futurist AI was also a remote setup. My partner is in Chicago. Hmm. I'm in New York City. Some of the people who support us are all over the place. Mm -hmm. So as long as everyone does their job and I'm able to monitor that they do their job, you know, uh, in the grand scheme of things, I don't really see any huge problems uh, on my part. And regulatorily speaking, we don't really need to have, you know, a physical office at some point. And because, you know, I did most of uh, the work, I didn't really need to fundraise. Hmm. Therefore, I don't really need to have an office uh, to show up investors, mm -hmm. it makes it easier. It does make it easier, yes. So, so what do you think is the future of remote employment and what do you think can be done differently to make it more effective? Um, 
the, uh, the, the, most, the, the biggest difficulty that you will have in remote employment, generally speaking, as it extends into different type of businesses, is the boundaries. Mm -hmm. uh, because typically when you are at work, and again, it depends on the work, um, w when you are at work, you're at work, when you're at home, at home. If you work from home, uh, people, and I, actually companies also have to determine the best ways of creating boundaries so that, um, again, your employees could be actually off work. Mm -hmm. Because what you do not want, yes, I mean, uh, obviously some, uh, you, some companies want to push productivity and such as far as they can. But, you know, if you're a smaller team, you also want to manage burnout. Mm -hmm. And if you're investing in, in, in people, you want them to, function relatively well over the you know long um, long periods of time and if you don't let people really off work at any point in time usually the outcome is less than desirable it is yes i i personally have worked from home for over 10 years and i personally I, I go to my gym almost every day around five o'clock just the uh, right yeah, to draw I, that boundary yeah the, the, that is important and one of the things that is probably many businesses are experiencing is, you know, for certain people, it's probably the first time that they had to work from mm -hmm. home in any significant way. So they're not used to it. And more to the point, some of their employers are not used to it either. Right. So I think, yeah, there has been an adjustment, but I think people have come through it pretty well. Eventually, but I think you need, you will need to develop policies as a company. Yes. To make sure that this is get this get this get this gets done in a uh, proper way. Yeah. So, what is the story behind Futurist AI? What what products do you offer? Uh, who's your target audience? Uh, all those things. Uh, well, F Futurist AI started as um, as a side project for me to update my technical skills. So it's something that I said, oh well, wouldn't it be cool if I could basically download every every piece of news in the US every day, have a system, have an AI effectively read them, and then uh, determine how the opinion was, uh, what's changing. So I started to build it, and then I went to see uh, the vice dean of research at Columbia Business School, and we were speaking on a totally unrelated project, and I said, oh, I'm doing this. Mm -hmm. I said, great. And he said, does it work? And I said, I have no idea. <laughs> uh, so he said, well, if you can train with basically the information you're getting, then it means actually it works. Mm -hmm. it's predictive. So I said, great, let me try that. So I built a second set of machine learning or call it AI. Um, and I started basically uh, trading uh, the S&P 500 ETF. Mm -hmm. And over 18 months, I outperformed the S&P 500 by trading the S&P 500 uh, by 25 percentage points. And of course, this was before. Mm -hmm. um, uh, th that's basically my test ended in uh, 2019, in mm -hmm. uh, August of 2019. Uh, then I said, well, this seems to be working. Why not basically expand this? and have a platform that uh, tells retail investor, well, you should consider trading this stock today. Mm -hmm. uh, the nice thing with the, the service is you know very quickly if it works or it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Because you know, if I give you a recommendation, it either you'll either make money or you'll lose money. Uh, so we launched our platform on a beta basis in um, December, 2019. And since that time, we're beating the S&P 500 by about 81 percentage points. Wow. Uh, yes. It's <laughs> That's significant. Uh, uh, yeah. So, so far, we have been right uh, in all the uh, trading signals we've given. We've been right 68 percent of the time, hmm. which um, is a very, very, very good outcome so far. Mm. And we were actually helped by what happened with um, uh, with what's happened in the marketplace because as the uncertainty uncertainty has uh, increased, 
people have been trading more and more on just emotion and uh, uh, hearsay, effectively, mm. and momentum, which our system tends to really, really uh, uh, analyze in the proper way. Yeah. Uh, the yeah the real breakthrough that we had is we were able to find that um, human emotion basically follows a very specific mathematical distribution and that makes it predictable. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is something that no one seems to have, all, to have uh, stumbled upon, which is mm -hmm. uh, good for us. Yeah. But it's applicable basically in marketing, in politics, in uh, mm -hmm. lots of other yeah. Uh, fields. Yeah, almost anything, right? Uh, yeah, and um, I, again, the fact that you're able to see this distribution mm -hmm. is actually quite interesting because, for example, say in politics, lots of people assume that uh, you know you have lots of people on the right and lots of people on the left. That actually is not the case, mm -hmm. and I could basically prove it to you mathematically. But that's not. Um, I I believe you. Uh, we won't go into that because right. <laughs> it upset some people, but uh, I'm going to take your word for that. Uh, but, 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 I mean, I, again, so so the, the, uh, the idea that I had was to effectively do a very, very simple product, hmm. give this uh, to, to retail investors, and then they can use their own judgment to determine if they want to execute the trade or not. Hmm. And uh, the, the type of, the, the challenge we have is to basically identify stocks that we believe you know before the open are going to move enough so that it's going to actually make money open to close not taking into account the pre mm. you know the pre-open movement obviously yeah very good so i mean it sounds like you started your company as a remote company is that correct yeah, that's correct yes so did you have to do anything special for that or it just happened naturally well it was naturally because this is how i would um how I operated most of my career anyway. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really have the need of, um, uh, of spending extra money just to have an infrastructure, which right. I was only going to occasionally use. Right, yes. So it's very interesting. So the, the current pandemic caused a lot of companies to go remote, you know, and in our case, it was March 16. Um, you didn't have that issue, but did it cause any uh, roadblocks or challenges that you didn't expect? I mean, for uh, for what we are doing, not not really, not yeah. in any way. If if anything, it actually increased the interest in our product because most people are staying at home, mm -hmm. and for certain people who are interested in um, uh, in trading. And again, for the past two years, the statistics are that people are being trading more and more, especially since um, uh, since Robinhood uh, effectively to, took away their mm -hmm. transaction costs. So we, we haven't felt it, obviously. I'm in New York City and um, I had many friends who were affected by, uh, by COVID. So from that perspective, it, you know, I don't think no one has been not right. affected. Right. So it, it is very sad that's what's happening. And, but fortunately, what I'm doing is one of the probably rare things that technically isn't affected by, um, by, by the, the COVID epidemic. Uh, directly or indirectly. Yeah, that's good. So for companies like Gaper that help develop, build and scale products, especially for startups, how important do you see this be being going forward for companies that need to hire, you know, quality talent and they need to hire them um, quickly to build up a product? Uh, again, it depends what the product is and what the application is. Just to, uh, you know, put it in the context of say my company, I may want at some point to basically redesign my customer facing website mm -hmm. and, um, and that. So for that, would I need to basically, could I do it myself? Sure. Mm -hmm. Would I want to? No. Mm -hmm. Could I get basically people who could be deploy this in an efficient way? Of course. Now the back end of it, would I basically get anyone outside uh, have access to it? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. So there will be certain things that yes, I think companies can outsource very comfortably. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you want to have your website redesigned or your, your user experience uh, improved, uh, clearly I'm not, you know, uh, mm -hmm. the best designer, get the best talent, let them work, and then deliver the product. 
on certain occasions, the, the only type of concern that you might have is that if you work on a project or per, per project basis, you might lose some of the intellectual capability mm -hmm. as the project ends and then basically people fade away and do right. other projects for other clients. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, as someone that is someone, so if you use it reasonably for certain things, it's perfectly adequate. For other type of applications, of course it's not. Right, you need that in-house expertise for, for your, well, it, it would, what we call would, our secret sauce. Well, yes, uh, I mean. Um, but know, that's you I'm, in your case, so. Uh, uh, correct. Correct. Or, you know, specific in-house expertise would be helpful in the context of yeah. certain things. Yeah. Well, very good. So, uh, Burra, this has been uh, fascinating. It sounds like a really interesting project. That, and I'm, I am really impressed that you've been able to do this by yourself pretty much in two years. And you have yeah. a product up and running. Uh, that is very impressive. I want to thank you for your time today and good luck. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. Have a great day. Thank you.